Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for stopping by the podcast with Bobby Beans. Much appreciated. Uh, hopefully you got to enjoy another pretty nice weather day. Um, went to the Frisbee golf rolfing spot just down the road here uh, a couple blocks. Man, I've never seen so many people out there in my life. That was awesome. Um, we'll take it, especially this time of year. Um, thank you for stopping out. If you stop out, make sure you let us know where you're from. If you got questions, feel free to pop them in there. Um, and make sure we also get kudos to Higher Love, our sponsor of the podcast, partner of the movement, just overall great folks up there in the UP. I uh, don't know where we would be without their support and their help. So much love to Higher Love. If you haven't tried them out yet, make sure you do. Uh, a lot of you have uh, let me know that you stopped out there, and it sounds like a lot of great things. So also going to be out there on the 23rd uh, when they open up their Menominee location is going to open up in store uh, for the first time. So really looking forward to some deli style flour out there. But uh, with that, I want to get things kicked off. Also a quick shout out to Ignite Dispensary, who has been a huge help this month as well. Um, and they, we've been collabing on a few different things. So much love to the Ignite Dispensary family. Speaking of much love, advocacy, cannabis, all that, let's get the man himself in here, Mr. Philip Scott, my man. How you doing, Philip? What's up, Beans? Hey, man. Thanks for stopping out. Thanks for hopping on. Uh, hopefully, we don't break the internet, you know? I've, I've <laughs> heard that happen. <laughs> heard that happen a time or two, but no. Uh, I am not indulging tonight, so I should be able to keep us on course um, as best as I can. Uh, just because I'm looking forward to the different topics we can touch. And um, you've been a great, um, I guess I would call it like a mentor for me too, um, even just in the fact that, you know, you were out there doing the advocacy work um, and that for some years. So really excited to have you on the show. And, man, we got a lot of topics we can touch on, so kind of broke down a couple that we could come up with. And let's start chopping it up, man. Uh, but if you want to introduce a little bit about yourself and just kind of your background, just to get you familiar with some folks that, that tune in regularly but might not know who you are. Well, big shout out to the Let's Legalize Wisconsin community for supporting this adventure. You know, coming together as a voice is huge. It's good to see. It's good to see. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't know, a little background of me in 20, I don't know, I started my adventure in this stuff about 2014, you know, doing that thing, but got real heavy 2017 going into 2018 um, and helping write the hemp law for the state of Wisconsin. Um, and then from there, evolving it into hemp point two, hemp 2.0, and then trying to give some guidance to the state as we rolled into the USDA program through that adventure. Um, but I don't know, we, we got together one day in the probably 2017 and we started the Wisconsin Hemp Farmers and Manufacturers Association because we saw that hemp was coming from the federal level out of the research program under the farm bill that was designated in 2014. And kind of just put some stuff together and realize, wait a minute, we don't have anybody like from the community. We don't have anybody out there that's an advocate that, you know, is strong about the cannabis or hemp plant. And I looked at how the legislature was thinking about moving forward on the hemp laws. And I'm like, there's nobody out there. There's nobody really out there batting for the people. If somebody doesn't go batting for the people, man, these corporations are going to come in and take the whole industry overnight. So that's kind of how I got started there in 27 2018 and, and just put my foot in the ground and wouldn't take no for an answer with anybody whether you were a legislature another advocate group a business we just wanted to figure out a solution on getting this so then we had the availability to move forward if that makes sense no absolutely and when um it's interesting how you said that because like that's how i felt um just a few months ago even um as far as like the cannabis or the the cannabis retail or the cannabis um shops in wisconsin it was like yeah it was trying to just like how do we work with other shops how do we find other people in the community to like be a part of this so it's kind of interesting that um you know here we are still kind of having those issues with cannabis especially in wisconsin um but i think it's been a I mean, I don't know about you, man, but I'm super glad that I, I met you because it's like a lot of times I'm like, am I nuts? Is this ever going to what am I doing? But to hear somebody share kind of a similar story and then like just kind of attacking all the different aspects. And if we the people stick together, it is it's even now, like once legalization 
you know, actually starts getting some traction in the state, that's really when we got to step up and the business has got to step out because we can't let it just be, you know, another um, industry taken over by the big money players before anything gets introduced. Um, so it's just a neat uh, perspective when you bring that up. Uh, Waldo, like Waldo says, I like to think cannabis brings everyone together. Absolutely. Um, but you still got to fight off that big money, especially in cannabis. Um, I kind of went down a rabbit hole today with that whole uh, as far as like businesses and when they write off, if they have a party and stuff, and then you can say that the cannabis costs this. I just, oh my God, there's <laughs> all this. It's crazy. It's going to take a all lot kinds of, of loopholes, just like our industry. <laughs> no, nope, exactly. I heard that. Um, real quick. So were you in the hemp industry? Um, like, were you, um, were you a grower of hemp or anything? Or like, what was the first kind of, you know, for you, was hemp always the same as cannabis or? I just know there's a lot of people that sometimes will hop on and they hear us talking about hemp and they think we're not talking about cannabis and just like how that kind of went down for you, I think would be kind of insightful. Oh, well, all right. Well, I'll give everybody a rundown just real quick. Um, I don't know. I'm about to turn 35 here. I've smoked cannabis since I was 12. You know, I'm part Native American with my Native background. We believe in the herbal medicine. So I hurt myself in sports when I was a little bit younger and my mom was not all about smoking cannabis, but we knew cannabis did help relieve pain. So we put it in a little bit of gummy. And of course it was against the doctor's orders and everything else and child services wanted to put her in jail. But at the end of the day, they couldn't do anything because you know that's what we believe in as our indigenous people. So ever since then, I've always just used cannabis as a way to help my pain and, and stay calm through life and tough situations because life gets hard sometimes. And I had always used it and then I'm sitting around in 2013, 2014, and I see the U.S. Farm Bill get signed and I see them go, oh, well, we're going to allow hemp for research. And I'm like, well, I don't know much about this hemp, but it looks when it when it's younger, it looks just like cannabis when it grows. So that's when I started really doing research on the, like, OK, we got cannabis. What is hemp? Oh, hemp's made of rope. Hemp's ditch weed. OK. And then went down that rabbit hole and it just started opening up everything like whoa there's way more to this whole thing than even i know at that time and it just opened that door so i was sitting at work one day at 2015 quick jumped on an airplane at vacation i was a ups driver go teamsters <laughs> <laughs> um got on an airplane flew out to colorado and colorado at that time had the first research hemp you know type pilot program running in their state sure and I'm, I fly out there and I land and I get there and I'm like hanging out with my friend. I'm like, well, how in the heck am I going to find these farms? Like, nobody's going to talk to me. They're so hush hush, just like the cannabis, because in 2012, you know, yeah, was just, just, it was still like, well, I don't want to show you my stuff. <laughs> right. We want to be the ones to figure it out. Yeah, it's kind of like the Wild West of, of cannabis at the time. So I just, so I'm like, okay, so I drive to Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado, and I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, there's gotta be a way. So I get on the state system and I get on this other phone logs and I'm somehow pieced together like, all right, well, here's three addresses that are potential <laughs> these farms. I might get shot, but let's drive out there. Fuck it. Oh, sorry. Well, Screw it. You're, you're good. We <laughs> mark it as explicit when we upload it to Spotify. So you can swear all you want. Okay. <laughs> well, because my understanding is, Philip, so like at this time, people are quite literally treating hemp like you would protect your cannabis today. Like it yes. was, it's not, it wasn't a joke, especially when you're trying to be the pioneer and actually figure out what I'm sure most of these guys were figuring out hemp and cannabis and what the hell can we grow? So yeah, it's uh, it definitely, you know, it wasn't like you're just like, oh, hey, you grow hemp, peace and love, right? <laughs> it's a, <laughs> no, definitely not. Like it was very hush hush, like back door. Like I'm going to pick up, you know, do a drug deal. Basically, it was sure. weird. It was weird. So I, I travel the three addresses. The first two are duds. There's nothing. The third one, though, I drive up and I'm like, I can see a greenhouse. I know yeah. there's something here. They're growing something. <laughs> so I'm like, well, how? I don't want to. I can't go on this property. They'll shoot me. Like I don't want to do that because Colorado, like it's legal to do that there. So I'm like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna play this safe. I'm just gonna park here. Sure. So I decided I had a partner with me from Wisconsin. We just parked there for four or five, six hours. The people drove yeah. out. The workers drove out. Somebody opened the gate. Workers drove out. And we flagged one down. He's like, bro, like, what are you guys doing here? And we're like, well, we we want to learn hemp and cannabis. Like, we, like, we want to learn. You guys are doing it here. You guys are like the pioneers of this stuff. And we're like, like well, we're not going to work with you. I'm like, well, you're going to work with us. So finally... I get this phone number for a woman that they call the grasshopper of Playblow. 
So out there you get trained to work in the industry and then the grasshopper takes your information is what they call there. And then as you grow and need help with employees or whatever, you'll tell her, hey, I need 10 employees at this address tomorrow. She'll organize you 10 certified people. They're licensed and insured and she'll get them there. So I go meet with her the next morning and she's like, you know what? I tell her my life story, tell her what on. I tell her I'm not, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm not even in their market. I can't even compete with these people sure. at this like, at all. And she's like, let me make a call. She calls that farmer and they agree to let me onto the farm for a day. And I million questioned everything. <laughs> Why is this like this? Why is that knob to the right? Why is that window tilted open? Like everything I questioned. And that's, I learned a vast amount of knowledge to be able to then fly home and then on my breaks at UPS for the next year, be able to punch everything into my board and then go through my phone because we have smartphones and just further the research sure. and everything. And that's how I got started. In this. So you almost you kind of had like chat GPT before chat GPT because you had like the people you needed to ask. It's one thing to, you know, you can get so lost when you start a search down Google or whatever. And, you know, you start on one thing and then the next thing you know, you're reading about this or that the other. But you quite literally had like people hands on growing and working with the, these weird laws that they're probably not even super familiar with. So basically because you kind of, you know, took a chance and you're like, screw it. I'm going to figure it out. And uh, well, I'll be honest, Bobby, man, they had at one point, the farmer finally told me before I left, he goes, we had a rifle pointed at you the whole time. If you would have came over that fence, like, and I was like, Oh, glad I never jumped that fence. Like, <laughs> yeah, no shit. That's uh, yes. Yeah, good thing they didn't do that. So yes, yeah, still be, still be careful of your Colorado growers out there. You never know what you're going to be running into, but uh, is there one of the things that I've noticed across the state? Um, and I'd kind of like to see what your take is um, deal with a lot of the farmers. Um, do, do you think, or what do you think makes Wisconsin uniquely suited for growing cannabis? And how do you leverage these conditions for uh, your products or just for us in legalization? Well, I don't know. Like when you really break that down, like Wisconsin previously was the hemp production capital of the world and essentially an agriculture blood on top of that. We have excellent conditions like soil, water, availability and weather for hemp. But mostly importantly, our farmers are truly dedicated to what they do, producing a top notch product while taking care of their land and families. And when you really break that down even further, we're talking about cannabis could be one of the last true agricultural, true commodity crops that brings a little bit of generational wealth to these families that may not have much anymore, as well as even if I can plant 100 cannabis plants, it's going to help me offset my taxes if I can get rid of those plants. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that formula. No, I th I, but I, I, I also that. think that we have the best, some of the best group of farmers. We have some of the best groups of soil. And we also, you know, in certain parts of the state, if it gets real dry out for some reason, we have high pivot capacity wells to be able to move water. So it gives us a little bit of competitive advantage to be able to fight all kinds of different hazards along the way. No, nope, that makes sense to me. Um, and I think it's just, I mean, I guess I don't know where it'd be i don't know that you can track like i just feel like wisconsin like any any town you're in you can drive 10 minutes and find a farm like it's just in our blood and i think a lot of the i think i would think that a lot of that is stuff that you can't just read in a textbook because a lot of a lot of times something that people don't really think about is the actual work and effort that goes into growing and how like you need to know your soil you need to know your ph balance of your water and and the fact that you know you've if you can find the generations that have been around because they've been learning that, that soil, that farm, you know, like that's just huge. That's, I, I really just picture this huge, crazy, crazy cottage industry where, you know, all these farmers, whether they, they start out with a little grow and it turns into bigger or however, it's just, we, we have the land and we have the farms to do it. It's, it's just crazy that it were here. We are talking about this, trying to grow a plant in Wisconsin, like, I don't know, it just sounds kind of counterintuitive, but <laughs> not, not by our choice, obviously. Um, let's see here. We've got a couple more questions on the list. Could you walk us through the process of transforming hemp from seed to consumer-ready products? I'm assuming you do that as well. Well, I mean, that's there's a, it depends on which route you go. I mean, when you break down hemp and cannabis, I mean, realistically, I mean, you have the fiber side, you can take the stalks that need to go through a decorticator and you can buy expensive machinery or, you know, there are ways the flack industry has showed us using their equipment along the way that you can do things by hand. It's not very cost effective, obviously, 
for the way you know we do this in today's America. But there are machineries out there and ways at small scales to do it by hand for the fiber side. And then there's the grain side where you know you can use your big tractors and do an industrial plant of you know two three hundred acres, and you can take off the top and harvest those plants and dry them and try to keep them food grade available and then press them into seed or get them crushed into hemp hearts and separated. And then from there, I mean, you have obviously the cannabinoid route and there's all kinds of different ways, I guess you could do that. I mean, there's the ethanol soaks where they, they harvest it, dry it, soak it in ethanol and then extract. There's the type where you harvest it, dry it, um, and then put it through CO2, um, you know, that way. But you still have to winterize that product to get it to convert. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know. There's a, there's a big argument there. I won't go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Um, and then, obviously, there's dry sifting and then the, the fun bubble hash with a little bit of ice and water. You know, you use a big spin machine and separate it well with your bags. So, there's all kinds of different yeah. ways. Where yeah, it just it's depends on what are you looking for and what are you looking to do, sure. I guess. There's and a ton of versatility. To go back on your thought on, like, is farming a lot of work to do these plants? Yes. At the end of the day, it is a lot of work and it is a headache. It is just like any other commodity crop. And actually, after the first year or two of doing it, I just started telling people, man, if you, you want to get into hemp or cannabis and, and you're afraid to talk to other people, because it was kind of still a little hush hush in 2018, 2019, that type of stuff. Sure. I said, find an old tobacco farmer in Wisconsin and go ask him how much work it was to take that crop from seed to shelf. Sure. And people would go, wait, what? And I said, it's it's probably hard, just as hard, or if not a little bit harder to be able to handle the whole crop and be able to move it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh like I said, even just trying to to do a little grow myself back in the day, it was just to get the damn thing. Oh my god, way more shit than you can imagine. Um, it'd be really cool to do like a documentary of the process because it's just so much to get, you know, it, it would be one thing if we're even just to cut and trim and get good um bud you know, it still isn't super simple, but yeah, to make any, anything else, especially as far as uh, with this and that kind of stuff, it's like, man, you need a couple scientists on deck. Um, Waldo has a question here. Do you see a future for hemp as far as fiber and seed type plants? It seems like everyone wants to just grow for CBD, CBG, THCA. Can one farmer really grow for both with the risk of pollen crossing into the females? Well, so that's a whole bunch of questions in one, but realistically, yes, I do think that the there are farmers in our state and groups in our state that are working hard, heavily with either behind closed doors or a little bit more open with the UW systems to get more grain and fiber in the ground. There are groups with money that are working on, you know, there's the battery thing being put together by Portage there that's hit the news lately. But there's other groups too working on decortication and dehulling and then being able to w get the timing right to be able to harvest the grain crops, especially because of the mold in the fields. So some farmers are still testing how do you do that right? It's a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then obviously the triploids that are coming out from out west. I mean, those type of with the, the three genomes in there, those type of plants, I mean, they don't get pollinated and they don't have the thing to produce the seeds. So they are expensive though. Until those that market develops more and comes in, it's, it's going to be hard to plant. I guess all three together. I, but you know, somebody like me, I'll plant a grain and a fiber next to each other and put a thousand plants of CBD in the field because I don't care if they seed. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna harvest those plants dry them. I'm gonna separate the seeds out and then take my material and still process it into something, and then have seeds to be able to restock and plant or. You know, you can still, I, I've sent in CBD small seeds and got them behold before just because I had so many of them sitting around in buckets. I mean, you got to find a value added way to move it down. Get it pouncing around for sure. Um, Dustin says sterile genetics is a challenge without help from other states. That would sound like a definite not fun situation. Uh, Waldo has said triploids question mark. I've seen that pop up a couple of times. What the hell is that, Philip? Um, it's got three, three genomes, basically three chromosomes, sorry, <laughs> three chromosomes <laughs> basically, and it doesn't allow the plant to produce the seed and it doesn't allow, and then one of them doesn't allow it to accept pollen too. Okay. So the plant you plant. So I've seen them at $6 a seed from out West right now, just for a CBD version of that type of plant. A cannabis seed could range between six and $15 per seed, depending on if you know the breeder or not. So 
that does need to develop over time here in Wisconsin, especially with our pollen risk. And, you know, obviously with the farmers that do have grain in the ground right now, I mean, I know one, I think he's got 250, 300 acres in the ground. There's another guy that's got another hundred in the ground by Eau Claire. I mean, that's enough pollen right there to blow 15 to 25 miles in a good, on a, on a real good stormy day. So we do need to figure that out in Wisconsin, I think, as we move forward. Definitely. D brings up an interesting, so D here is from Illinois. He says, I'm from Illinois, moved to Wisconsin about three weeks ago and getting used to cannabis laws here. And I'm on a defense over the law on why THC isn't legal, but the state will allow Delta products with THCA, THCP, THCX, like all these products produce a high, somewhat natural, like the real thing. I support it all, but I'm itching my head like, hmm, welcome to Wisconsin, my man. Um, I want to touch base on that. Yeah. So in 2018, we read the U.S. Farm Bill as it was written, right, <laughs> and digested that 2014 bill and like how it was still available. And then we started talking to legislatures in Wisconsin, and then we started meeting with Ledge Council to, you know, take their language and move all the stuff forward. But we left that language so I don't want to say open ended, but we left it in a way where. I guess it was very hard for lots of people to interpret because we wanted to be able to move different cannabinoids because we knew they were coming from research and things like that, you know, to market without all the restrictions like other states have had where they banned Delta 8, they banned THCP, you know, they banned all these minor cannabinoids. But when we wrote that original law, we left it so open ended. And then we knew the lobby groups in DC left that so open ended. And we, our chemists knew the THCA was still a gray area but we were like let's do it let's just leave it open and we 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 truly believed in 2018 when we wrote the hemp 1.0 bill for the state of wisconsin that we effectively legalized marijuana that day and everybody laughed at me I, i'm telling everybody in the state you're you're an idiot you're a fool don't do that you're gonna get arrested our attorneys told us you're going to jail like and we're like, I mean, the law says we can do this if you interpret it correctly. And I can defend on what I interpret if I need to on the stand. So I'm going to do this. So in 2018, we started just testing the markets a little bit. And luckily, I live in Madison where the laws are a little bit more lenient in our favor to be able to do what we do. So I'd say in the end of 2018, we were already kind of testing that THCA type flower push to market. And we're successful at it. Never got raided or arrested. So, knock on wood. Yes, there's <laughs> a knock on the door. No. Um, and uh, oh, we had a couple of quick on. It uh, looks like Dane stopped by to say hi to Phil. We had a couple more earlier. I forgot to highlight, or I I highlighted them, but I let you keep talking. But uh, Momo and Nicole brings up a great point. Can we just normalize like we do with beer? That would be pretty, um, not crazy in my book. I mean, just yeah. You can go buy as much beer as you want. And if you drink a shit ton, you got to deal with the consequences. It's, I mean, you know. Well, I'll talk about that too. The, tav the Tavern League, Bobby, like everybody's like, oh, it's the Tavern League. And I've told everybody since 2019, it ain't the Tavern League, guys. And sure enough, as soon as COVID ended, the Tavern League and a lot of their bars that they distribute to and their distributors started selling CBD gummies, started, you know, testing the markets. And I'm like, it ain't, it ain't the Tavern League, guys. Unfortunately, I think it might have been for a while. But sure. something switched there where I think their attorneys caught on to what the rest of us were doing in the state. And they're like, well, we can make some money off this. What are we doing right now? <laughs> right. So, and then you started seeing after COVID, you started seeing a lot of bars have CBD type gummies. You know, I know one one of the distributors that carry the alcohol in the state, they got the Martha Stewart brand on contract. So it's like, come on, give us some love locally, guys. You know. Yeah, no kidding. We'll get there. Uh, <laughs> man, right. Maybe you'll know this. This is uh, backtrack in a second. But. Is Madison the only city, someone had said last podcast in the comments, that they were quite certain that Madison was the only city that you can legally smoke cannabis outside in? Is that a thing? Yes. Now, I in know the US? Lot, I know there's a lot of other cities trying to move ordinances and stuff like that right now through, but I don't want to say we still are, but for a while there, yes, we were one of the only cities in the country. You would not, they can't do anything. <laughs> That's crazy. I need to move, I really need to move down there. Um, Waldo says, what does Philip think the farm bill will change? Yes, I do think this next farm bill and, and that I truly, let me restart. I truly believe the U S government 
didn't sign this next farm bill and just extended it till the, I think it's September 21st of this year to give them more time to talk about it. Cause the farm bills are signed every five to seven years. Right. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's so many States around the country that are banning Delta eight and banning THCP and all those other different, you know, minor cannabinoids that are out there that aren't, and aren't intoxicating, but could be to some people right. Medically. Sure. <laughs> Not I making know. medical claims. Quote FDA. unquote. <laughs> but I do think that they're going to start to go and say you can't synthesize and convert your isolates into the next step, but they won't go after THCA after speaking to my friend Dustin and a couple of the other people around the industry. Like they can't go after the THCA because it's naturally occurring, but they can go after that synthetic conversion. And I think they're going to because there's a lot of lobby groups in DC that have a lot of money that's been paid from the cannabis industry, <laughs> cough, cough, yeah, yeah. which is crazy to me. Let's go spend a bunch of money to shut down a, these hemp farmers because now they're making too much money and they're competing. So that's what they're doing in DC behind closed doors. And I do think it's going to happen. I think they're going to ban that synthetic conversion. Right on. Yeah, that's uh it's something, man. It's definitely a lot of back and forth. And CSGA, hey, baby, naturally occurring. They can't do anything about it. That's that's what it seems to be, man. I mean, it's I I hey, if they ask me questions, I'm like, yo, hang on, I gotta call Philip. <laughs> call Philip. Let me ask Philip. <laughs> um, we we've got well, blah, blah, blah. legalized to revolutionize. What steps do you believe Wisconsin needs to take towards legalization, and how could this revolutionize the state, my man? Oh man, I've had so many ideas over the years thrown at me. I've sat down and just written ideas out. I, there's no right way or wrong way to do this, to be honest with you, other than there's 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 really one stone in the way. The, the Senate's willing to move. A big chunk of the Assembly's willing to move. The people want something. Literally, it's crazy to me because back last fall, I met with Republican Party. I'm not going to name the, the parties who I met with because I don't like to stir the pot. Like, I don't need to do that. We keep people friendly, right? Yeah, but I yeah. met with people in the Republican Party, and I was told directly, like, we're, we're going to move something forward with cannabis that's going to happen. We're going to get these votes in because we're tired of, you know, the blue party, the Democrats using – using cannabis to move forward and get these voters out to the polls. We want, we want to remove that piece from their mouthpiece. And like all of them were saying, like, it was, it's crazy, you know? So like when that happened, like, I don't know, man, like, <laughs> I don't know. They want to move something forward to, to remove that piece of the voting. There is a good democratic bill written by Melissa Agard or Sergeant Agard, you know, she's back and forth, but I don't know. I don't know the true path to move forward and, uh, and it's tough this year because they just closed session yesterday already, which we should bash them. That's terrible. Like we pay you guys full time. Why are you working part time? I swear Wisconsin is like one of the only legislatures paid full time to show up and do part time work, bro. And they get a retirement package. <laughs> well, it's not even like close. I could see if you're like, oh, we we're at a standstill. So we're going to shut it down a week early. Like, bro. <laughs> It's yeah, this is like uh showing up to work for like two months, like yo, I'm gonna take the rest of your off. Yeah. Like what? So because yeah, the the now, our good legislatures, they, they still get out in their community and do stuff, but there's a big chunk of the legislatures that don't. They just take that check and they hide in their office, they run their businesses, they do their thing, you know. Yeah. It's messed up because we pay you to listen to us. Right. And, and how dare you close the session yet again and say there's nothing needed to be done in Wisconsin. Cannabis isn't the only thing. There's a list of things that need to be done around Wisconsin. So it's just crazy. 100%, man. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't understand politics, I guess. It's just <laughs> frustrating. Um, let's see. Do we have any other questions in the comments here? D's got another one here. We got thousands and thousands of people who stand on legalization. Like, think about it. The money it would bring to the state, the help for schools and cities. Missouri made hella when they legalized. Come on, Wisconsin, get the time. Can't yes, agreed with that, my man. Um, oh, Dustin said it's election year. That's a good point. That's why I think we need to really hit the listening sessions and stuff um, as they pop up. Or um, I don't know, man. We can't just let the, some of these guys just hide behind the counter and. Um, just keep getting elected without uh, 
you know, moving for the voice of the people. It'd be one thing if it was like 52% of the state wants legalization, but you know, the high, uh, what was it like 86 or for medical 86% and then the best you could come up with in the Republican party is what we had. Like, yeah, it's just, it's got to stop. Uh, Mama Nicole says, give me my medical card. Felt that. Well, we got to talk about that too. I yeah. really think we don't need to do like other states and go medical. We can go full rec. You know, in Wisconsin, it's we have a lot of hunters. Well, they always like to use the, the thing guns and cannabis and this and that. You get a medical card, you can't have a, a, a gun, a firearm. You can't even own a taser. You can't own a gun. You can't even own a, a, a pocket knife over like I think it's three and a half inches <laughs> without a concealed carry in Wisconsin. So if you can't get your concealed carry because you have a medical card, you're going to really restrict yourself. And I called out the Republican Car Party and Mary Fikowski on that. I'm like, how dare you try to move this forward without telling the farmers? If I get my medical card, you mean I can't go shoot them deer that I have my ag tags that are eating my corn? That is messed up across the board. And she went real quiet up there in the committee. It, 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 <laughs> but it's the truth. Like, yeah, how dare you do that? Right. In and today's to, world. And to try and like just pull the wool over the eyes on that. Yeah. So, I can go down the road, break my leg. Hey, bro, I need some Oxycontin and I still got my gun. I could be doped out on oxycontin shooting the plate. Like, I'm not going to do that. Obviously, right. it's just an example of like, it, tell the people the truth. Right. A lot of people go and all oh, we want medical, no vote for it, and get it through, and then go wait. I can't own the gun no more. I have to choose now between my medicine and you know potentially having to protect me myself. Obviously, so. Yeah, that's one that really makes me scratch my head. That, uh, yeah, you know, you can have the you can be pulling a trailer load of Everclear. And uh, have your gun license, no problem. But God forbid you have medical cannabis in your possession at home or whatever. It's just uh, all you know, right. Something funny, Bobby. What's up? In 2018, we were moving 10,000 pounds of hemp on an ag truck between Wisconsin and Minnesota to get processed up in St. Paul at the time. <laughs> and we get pulled over because we blew past the way station, forgot we were in the ag truck. Just a, we were in like an F450, you know. Yeah. We had tag tag on the side of the truck. State patrol gets whoop whoop whoop. What do you guys got? We get we get arrested. You know, we get parked in the state patrol thing for okay. six hours, and finally they come back to like, well, you didn't tell us you were friends with the governor at the time, and then you knew everybody at the Department of Agriculture in Minnesota. And I'm like, yep. And I even emailed their offices and let them know I was transporting this. So now I'm going to sue all of you. And I sued the state patrol and won. Jesus. Well, I don't blame you, dude. Did they not believe you that it was cannab no. uh, hemp or what? It was straight. They thought they got the biggest bust in the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> the old F-450 with Bill Scott here, boys. We got 440,000 pounds. You know, more than it was great. Uh, I tell you, man, it's... Uh, um, I did stuff, right, I did my paperwork. I did my due diligence. I emailed them and said, "Hey, I'm transporting this over the state line." Just a heads up. <laughs> everybody was aware. Um, how are, uh, what kind of feedback do you get from people as far as like how is your hemp products contributing to wellness and health? Um, when it comes to your customers, I know you got a pretty, pretty broad lineup there. Um, it's is that part of what drives you too, as far as. Um, not just, you know, like for me, personal consumption, I'm not worried. I feel like, you know, I don't, I'm a lightweight, which is nice too, because I very rarely even have like an ounce total in my yeah. house. Um, so I always have small amounts, but like, I'm just comfortable going to Michigan, doing my thing. But it was once I started seeing what the plant could do for other people, is that kind of a similar thing for you too? Man, I always tell people, I didn't get in this to make money. Like I didn't get in this to be rich. I got in this to help people. Like, obviously, I've taken the product since I was 12. I know what the value of the product is. And it was always weird to me as a kid, like, why is this so bad stigma? And, like, I was the kid in school that got hated on because I refused to sign that dare crap. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> like, I'm not signing that. Get that away from me. And they'd always, they always, everybody always judged me for it. And I'm like, oh, I'm sure. Just with the stigma and, like, I don't know. It's It's weird to see through life now to go from, like, where it was completely illegal, like you're going to prison. I remember <laughs> in high school, I had like 18 plants growing and I was like, my dad found them and he's like, what are these? I'm like, oh, they're watermelon plants. Cause there was little babies. He's like, those aren't watermelon plants. <laughs> he's like, you don't like watermelon that much, son. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, and cause you, you also do some stuff with like soaps and stuff too. But yeah. So like, I don't know. The industry is, there's a lot of different products out there. So like my pain salve that we have, 
Um, that's probably my number one seller. We worked with a Native American medicine man and developed that formula. And it's got 6,000 milligrams of CBD in there is the big kick in it. Um, so that one is our most popular seller with the older generation for arthritis and, and things like that. Or, or the older generation now, unfortunately, they're having to get back up and have to go back to work. So ones yeah. that they haven't ever been able to quit, their hands hurt all the time. So they just wear a little cream on there and they're feeling a lot better. And then from there, like you have your tinctures, you have your gummies, your edibles. We have some smoke. We do have a little bit of soap. Soap is soap's weird. I got into that game a few years ago um, and, and figured out how to manufacture soap from scratch, basically, and, and learned from somebody that had been doing it for almost 30 years and took that business over and introduced it. And actually, in my store, we sell more soap than we do cannabis products. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, because we do a lot of farmers markets and things like that. So people, this older generation, they come in and get the soap and then we're able to talk to them about the hemp products. And I'd say we probably have a 90% retention rate that they walk out with some type of hemp product in their hand because we're able to talk to them one-on-one -on -one and make them feel comfortable and get them over that stigma of like, oh, reefer madness, you know, that was that was there. Do for doesn't have to be pushed in their face. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's there's some months we sell more salve than we do flour. Some months we sell more flour than we do salve. Lately, the edibles have been really been kicking off because I think I think more people are getting more comfortable just being able to take, we'll call it their medicine in public. Right. Sure. Um, and not being able to have to smoke it. But hey, I can pop this little gummy here and feel OK. Or I know you like to do that syrup. <laughs> I love my syrup, man. I love mixing those. <laughs> um dude and i had a i had an idea pop in my head if, the, if you want this idea you can have it i just every time you would use this or wear it if you change your name your logo of a company one day to this just remember me all the time that's all i want i don't want any royalties or anything but i think you're gonna like this i think that you need to uh come up with a company and, or like a dispensary this new kind of maybe like a lounge there too or something but it's got to be called rope and dope and uh Nice. Or no, soap and dope. God, I f***ed it up the first time. <laughs> soap and dope is much better than rope and dope because you're probably going to be selling rope. But um, I love it, dude. Soap and dope. That's basically how it works. Oh, no. Waldo, don't ask this question right now. Where's the Safe Banking Act at? Because Philip told me to look into the money side of things, and I have not gotten a chance to yet. So <laughs> we're that's one of the things we're trying to get uh, figured out. It's on my list to do. It is seemingly a nightmare like everything else, cannabis. Um, Todd says, I definitely need to find a good balm for pain reliever. Todd, where are you located again? Where's Todd coming to us from? Um, well, he's typing that up. Can you discuss the environmental benefits of hemp cultivation and why it might be considered the crop of the future? Wow. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of different benefits. If you do a little research on what like hemp can do for your environment, help can restore, you know, it can reduce what you actually put in and inputs and things like that across the board. But one of the big ones I've been working on with the state of Wisconsin and, and trying to get different aspects in the federal government of where we can bring money in is the PFAV situation in the state. Like at, oh, the end sure. of every, at the end of every one of these runways in Wisconsin at airport, there's PFAVs. I mean, it just shows over time that things are contaminated across the board. So like I've been pushing to get that going. And one of the cool things is the UW Stevens Point, uh, we actually wrote some letters of support and did, did, had a couple meetings with some high profile people to help them, you know, move that type of stuff forward. And they got a grant, you know, I think it's like 140 grand to start studying hemp, you know, plant hemp, hemp works as a sponge, sucks the PFAVs up. And then after that process, we'll probably torch those plants in an enclosed environment and then be able to separate, you know, as it off gases, the PFAVs in the container and everything else, you know, as it needs to, and be able to take that cylinder then and take the PFAVs and put them somewhere where they won't get re-released hopefully. So just stuff like that is huge, huge for our environment that is out there. And there's billions of dollars out there in U.S. federal grant money <laughs> For cleanup and stuff like that so that's why we've been really focusing on that and trying to get more money into the to their universities and i think if they get that first round done and they can prove that motto i think there's an additional round of funding for them to further that research too so oh, okay. those are fun little things that are happening around wisconsin i'll yeah i probably right on. they were in the news like a couple of weeks ago so i think they'll be cool with me talking about it <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure saw that uh waldo's a uw stevens point alum all right Good to hear. Uh, Todd says he's in New London. Do you ship by chance, Philip? Do you ship? Anything? I can, yes, I can, yeah. Okay. 
So uh, definitely shoot Philip a message. Um, let's see what we got here. My glasses, man, they got dirty, even though I'm wearing them. I don't know what's happening. Um, and I'm not, it's not smoke, man. There's no smoke going on over here right now. And Waldo, we're going to look deep into the banking stuff. I know a lot about yes. it. But I want Bobby to get caught up on it so we can do a, another podcast in the future. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, Todd says, any rights should not change because of cannabis use. Agree with that. Uh, Waldo says, did Philip run for office? I'm going to guess. Uh, well, I'll, t I'll tell you, be honest. I've been asked a lot. I've been approached by one party to potentially do that. And at this time in my life, I have two passions, well, three, uh, my family, cannabis. And then I, I play rugby in the state of Wisconsin still for one of the men's clubs in Madison. And then I coach rugby as well. I'm the secretary for, you know, youth rugby in the state. So I do a lot of stuff on that side. So I don't have a lot of time to be in office right now, but I do have the connections and avenues to get a lot of the doors open that potentially won't open. And I've been helping Bobby get in a few of those doors and other people as well to, to try and get what we want to do as a community out there. I'm a big advocate, man. I always tell Bobby, 21 plants. I need seven in little seedlings. I need seven in veg. I need seven in flower. And I can keep my stuff rotating and have plenty of medicine for me and a couple of my neighbors if they need it, you know, to relax. So 100%. Well, and I think I think it just does something about like the state of politics where they currently are. I feel like um, there's, don't get me wrong. There's, there's plenty there. I don't know if there's plenty, there's people who are in it for the right reasons. Um, and we can, you can just tell if you watch uh, some of your politicians, social medias, like kind of like you were talking to, they hide behind a desk or they out in the community. And unfortunately though, like even, even all the way to like the presidential um, side of things like from small town to big town to presidential like it doesn't make sense to me how much fighting and back and forth there is it should be a lot more i mean you don't have to agree on everything but there has to be some common sense at some point and just to know like this job should be not so full of hate and full of myself like it's it's representing the people and figuring out these tough things and not just no you want that in there we're not talking or you want that in there nope come don't even come back with it like i just feel like that wasn't how it was made to be and maybe i'm wrong but it just because uh yeah i had quite a few people talking to me too and it was like it not for one second did i ever like maybe it's just like god it just seems like a terrible chess game that you're missing half the pieces <laughs> like you know i don't know it just Maybe things will change. Um, I guess we got to just kind of keep working together as the people. And, you know, that's all we can really do. Keep pushing on them. Push well, them I, don't know. I don't know. We could do a little more organizing if we wanted to, like on the lobbying side and sure. that stuff. You know, like in 2018, we had a lobby day held at the Capitol um, for WIFMA, the nonprofit. I think we had 25 or 27 people come in and have – good conversation with us in the morning and then we had a breakout session and i think we hit uh, 52 or 62 offices in four hours we hit all of them wow. and flooded them with knowledge and you know i i told everybody too i was like when you're walking around here you when you go in the office you're probably gonna get their aids in a few of these offices but like they gotta go take their lunch breaks and stuff at some point so like we catch them when they're walking around hey i know you're walking to lunch but you got a minute and you just walk next to them and have a conversation because they're not going to be disrespectful when they're in the hallway so that oh, that's we, good we, we did things like that on that lobby day and we hit everybody i think we hit almost every politician that was available in the capitol that day okay <laughs> i'd be down for trying that again dude and fought them that. with knowledge and i mean it's just fun you know you know it, it takes a little bit of money to do that you know because we have to buy some food and stuff to be able to provide to people but true no i feel you there um we got another question here how can we combat the misconceptions about hemp and cannabis and what role does education play in this lots of education i mean i've over the years i've tried educating i'll call it <laughs> these politicians across the board man and not just politicians but you know the people as well but obviously the people side of it's getting easier because People are, are becoming more open to cannabis being in the community and around and where you go. So the community side, it's become a lot easier. But the politician side, and then like, how dare they tell you, especially you, after we've been banging the drum, and I know the old normal advocates and things like that that are out there in the communities, they've been banging the drums for years. Like, how do they say, like, we're not knowledgeable about cannabis. We don't know nothing about this. Like, how dare you? We have spent 
years and community and hours and parades and marijuana fest now is hemp fest like doing all this stuff and like how dare you nope 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 like no and then you go in there and they tell you the same thing like nope i don't know what that is i don't know how like how dare they like it's crazy to me <laughs> it, uh crazy is used a lot right when we're talking about stuff it just so like the education piece yeah it's needed it's got to go out there but i don't they're willing to listen but do they retain the information when we give it to them that's right. the bigger question I think we need to ask ourselves when we're talking to these people. That's like we give you all the information in the world. They can look me right in the face. But how are you retaining it? Like, are you telling a good enough story for them to relate to it and retain it? That's the one's kind of the key thing. I think you got because you got to tie into everyone and everyone's a little different, but it's such a complex plant. And even when you go into like a dispensary, there's such a diverse amount of products that yeah, there's gotta be a good like sit down at home and like kind of be able to like remember when you're uh like really little the kids and you got like you got to fit the block in the block hole and the circle in the circle hole but like you almost got to get it down to that level because it can be super overwhelming especially when a lot of cannabinoids are just one letter difference but the effects are way different um it's just it's a lot of information so it's definitely something that we got to keep kind of trying to figure out how to be the most effective with that so well, and the thing is, too, like I, with you gaining your community and the voice that you're doing and the representation, I like how you presented it to me. Ali, oop me the ball, man. Let's get this across the line. I remember that's like one of the first things you said yeah. to me. I was like, huh, maybe we should try to do that. That that might be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, dude. Absolutely, man. That's what it's about. We got to rock it together. If we keep trying to take these half court shots, we're not going to get them. But, you know, you, but although I can't jump, Philip. I don't know if you can jump. You're rugby, so just pretend it's a rugby ball up. <laughs> oh, we'll get up there. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, too, like the community as a whole, like we have a really good democratic will to move forward if we can get them to move it. But like at the end of the day, like even if I, us as a community, like if we wrote a bill, right, we'd have to write a bill. Then we'd have to find a politician, right, that would back our type of language that we would give them. And then that bill then would go to ledge council and ledge council then would do its magical thing that they do and that what they do is they just get it in a good language to make sure that the state isn't opening itself up to be you know sued basically sure. either from someone in the state or from the federal government so they'll tweak that language and try to get it in a good place and and obviously they'll bring in advisors like us hopefully to give them the proper information from the people and if they don't then we'll bang the drums so they listen and then they'll let us in at some point so that's just how it works <laughs> no right it's gotta be it's together, language thing. together you know i don't know do we want to write our own language as a community do we want to take what's out there and move it forward i really don't think medical is where we need to be going in today's world especially like the old joke that i always heard from the republican party like cannabis isn't going to be legal till 2025 in wisconsin and they've been saying that publicly not publicly but maybe mid public private conversation since 2017. oh shit, look at the freaking timetable we're on today we're yeah. coming up in 2025 and it might be right. So like who's pulling that fiddle string to hold them until 2025? Yeah. What the hell? That's bizarre. I'm, ask, I'm asking our community. Just think about that. Damn, dude. <laughs> I can't tell if he's fucking with me or not. No, he's being serious, folks. Um, Why is community so important in the hemp industry? And how does your work help bring together farmers, manufacturers, and enthusiasts? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I do know that I, in 2018 through 2020, right before COVID hit real hard, I traveled the state. I met with farmers. I met with processors. I met with stores. I met with local politicians. Anybody that would meet with me and talk about cannabis, law enforcement, like law enforcement asked me a few of them in the state, like, can you tell me, train me the difference between hemp and cannabis? Sure. I'll come give you a little one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know if it's going to do anything, but I'll give you a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> But the community part of it is huge because if we can work together as a whole, we can keep bringing our message together and use the bigger events that do draw attention to make make a lot of noise and let them know that we're here and that we're not just a bunch of stoners. Like we got, you know, people that work all day for a living and we got PhDs that take care of everybody in the world. So that smoke cannabis. Right. So, well, so as a whole, how do we get all those voices together? And you're doing that. <laughs> right. Well, the, exactly. We got to keep growing it because it is. And like, oh, Dustin's got to go into passion. 
I feel like that's what's neat about the plant is just how it can help so many people with so many different things. It's not for everybody, but I would say, like, I don't know, I still don't really know anyone who had an adverse effect to it. Um, there are people who don't listen when you tell them, like, you got to start out low, you got to find your gummy dosage, and then they take too much, and then they don't want to try it again, but that's on them. But um, it's just, it can help so many people with so many different things, and the fact that it's, and I think the toughest part for me is it feels like whether they know it or not, it feels like the people who are against it are just arrogant about it or, you know, this, this arrogance of not learning about the plant and seeing what the plant can do for people, not just myself, which is really just kind of a relaxation for the ADHD, uh, whatever, but like actually seeing people with serious health conditions that it can help, but because you think it's going to turn everyone into stoners, you say it's bad. Like that just drives me nuts. So it's got, you got to keep that passion though, because you got to, you can't, as we know, you can't just yell at people. Um, that doesn't really get the point across, even though, uh, I don't know. I just gets me worked up, man. I got to calm down a second. <laughs> Take a breather. Take one of your tabbies. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, Mike says, love you, Philly. Dane says, I can attest to the gummy dose, Phil knows. Oh, Dane had a good good, good evening one night on a gummy. <laughs> D says, I absolutely love cannabis and everything about it. Yes, passion, very passionate about the plant. Right on. Uh, cannabis can have a psychosis effect on people. Mental health meds always demix. Don't mix. Oh, don't mix. Gotcha. Uh, Corey stopped by to say hi. Appreciate that, man. Always appreciate you swinging by. Uh, let's take it to our next question, which involves the political landscape, our favorite. What's the current political climate in Wisconsin regarding cannabis legalization, and how can our listeners actively participate? I feel like we kind of hit on that one. Man, I think um, it's a political hotbed, Bobby. Seriously, I, I really think, like, not only did they close session early just because of the elections, like, they don't want to deal with us with the cannabis conversation. And sure. there's other things, obviously, happening, coming down from the federal level. Like, if they're not in session, they don't have to answer to it until they come back into session. So it's like... That's just crazy, dude. The, the political side of it is, we're done for we're done for now. You might as well just do this. And it just sucks. But we do know, like, until September 21st of this year, that we can keep doing what we're doing comfortably as an industry and making revenue and hopefully keeping some of those cannabis dollars that we're leaving the state to our THCA products and, you know, educating those consumers on that stuff. And so we're safe until September 21st. Now, when that new right. farm bill comes out, we all better be ready. You better have your business attorneys online if you work in this industry to make sure you're able to get in those guidances. And, and it's, I hate to say it, but every time there's a new law or some other bill written, there's always some kind of new gray area if, oh yeah it's all about how you interpret it so like we have to figure out like i hate to say but like when those new laws and stuff are written like we're gonna have to really break those down and like what can can we do how can we operate because i don't think it'll be the state coming to knock on your door i think it'll be the feds that'll enforce that type of language that's in the farm bill right well and if i remember correctly from taking my hemp growers course and all that stuff um i think it is january 1st that's when the um all i believe it was all hemp products need to be tested through a dea lab uh dea what's the word i'm looking for uh approved DEA lab lab yeah okay and so it, that's gonna... a process so like in 2022 there were only six labs that registered with the dea license in the state of wisconsin i don't know what that number is today because i know other labs have definitely applied for it but that process is a little expensive and it takes forever to get that certificate pushed through because the DEA knows they can drag their feet across the country based on the scheduling of cannabis right now. Now, when Schedule 3 comes, there might be a little more fire under their thing to get more lab certified. But until then, I don't know. I do know that they like that because when they run a sample, they they automatically transmit. Your, they give you your sample results, and it automatically, if a DEA certified lab does it, they transmit the results to the DEA. Okay. Gotcha. So that's why the USDA wants that, because it'll prevent us from, you know, pushing illegal crops to market. Because gotcha. the, the DEA, they don't have a list of everybody that's got tested hot, and they might come back in with questions. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty quick for that. Yeah. They'd be like, be, uh... like I said, it's still, it's still the Wild West, which... It, for an industry that's been around for 68 years and, you know, Colorado all the way back to 14, 
it's still crazy to talk about today. Even today, it's still kind of the wild west in the industry because you don't know where it's going to go. And if you aren't adaptable, you're going to go out of business. You got to be adaptable. Got to be. Uh, Corey says, I'm an Iraq vet. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate your service very much. Uh, this needs to be legal across the board. We prevent suicide for some. It did for me. Damn, bro. Uh, I'm glad you found the plant, and I uh, super appreciate your service. And uh, I've seen a lot of good uh, test or uh, not test um, results from studies recently as far as veterans go. And I um, feel like that is definitely something that we shouldn't have to be trying as hard for. But that makes the fight that much more worth it because when you know it's wrong, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I can't just sit back and be like, oh, that sucks. Like, that's just not how I work. So. <laughs> Um, call to action. How can listeners support local hemp businesses and get involved in advocacy efforts? Well, well, before COVID, we were a big avenue to try and work with the industry and take all that information in, but we've kind of downsized a little bit and, you know, reevaluated our place in the industry and maybe didn't want to touch base with everybody and travel the state anymore, become more of a little bit of a think tank type for us anyway. But, you know, when you develop what you're developing i think if we keep using your type of platform as a community to gather the voices and let you gather that knowledge and keep everybody interacting with each other i think it's a great outlet i mean the wisconsin definitely needs this i mean the right. politicians some of the politicians have been saying for years like somebody's got to get out there and get this community more intertwined and that stuff and you're a very outgoing person and and sometimes i'm a very you know, restricted person. So sure. I, I think just getting like what you've done with Hempfest, colliding those two scenarios together is awesome. I think with us now being comfortable enough to support those two organizations, you know, and the the triangles getting created there, I look at it. And then sure. you guys are very open like us now where we want to work with everybody in the state and just get something done, man. Right. It's, it's just, just keep talking about it. Keep learning. Keep <laughs> Keep growing it like a plant, man. We're a plant. Yes. We got to have them good roots. We're all the roots. <laughs> um, well, and that's thing too. Like, I don't know. It's for me on my end, Bobby, like, you know, I have my store. I do my advocacy stuff still. I don't do as much lobbying anymore. And honestly, I've never been paid to lobby. Everybody probably thinks I've been paid millions and this and that. I want to throw that out there. No, I've, I volunteer my time and I've never been paid really a dollar to lobby. So that, that, you know, I take that to heart. So, the other thing too in the industry, you gotta have support. You know, I we my wife, she does she takes care of the genetics and you know, does our crossbreeding and that type of stuff. And I don't know, you gotta it's a community, like you said. You gotta have everybody yeah. involved around you. <laughs> yep, it's all of us, man. Love it. Love it, love it. Um whoa, was that my last question? Uh -oh. No way. No. How can I just see? Oh, here we go. We got one. I got one last one. Did anyone else in the comments have any questions for us? Corey says, thank you guys for doing this. Absolutely, man. That's, uh, that's what it's about, man. Getting it, uh, getting us talking, getting us all together and uh, pushing through. We got to keep pushing. Um, we've got who are the other key players in the hemp industry and how can our listeners connect with them and further the movement? <laughs> Well, I, I would say anybody that's in the industry right now is a key player because these rules keep changing. So right. if you know anybody out there in hemp or cannabis industry right now, like try to talk to them, support them, you know, help them out if they need it. But I don't know. <laughs> well, and it's, it really is. It's even it's the hemp and the cannabis, because even though they're they're the two different sets of regulations when it comes to like, I don't know, I just follow, um, you know, Wisconsin cannabis laws and stuff or whatever but then also on a national level and like man states just keep going back and forth with like some states like florida wasn't it that it was um edibles only not smokables then it went to smokable flower not at yeah i don't like so many states are trying to figure out like literally anybody in the anybody in anything cannabis should just be sticking together because it's it's just a madhouse. And if somebody has a successful business, they're doing a lot to figure it out. So to, to tune into whatever they got going on, because um, even if it's, you know, one of the, I feel like even a company that looks like they're, you know, the kingpin, they are still behind doors. They got to be sweating bullets. Like the laws are just ridiculously changing as far as even like, 
Uh, places I'd find out they got to destroy hundreds of pounds of cannabis because they changed a lot of how much you can have in back stock. Uh, that was Missouri. Like, it's just. Well, and you see, so there's some states they're talking about uh, putting a cap on the THC percentage in some of the flour, too. Like, oh, you can only grow flour up to 10%. What? <laughs> <laughs> you're too good of a grower. Go away. Or your genetics are too strong. How dare you? Like, I don't know. It's just a control game, I think. So then they can control the price down the stream as they process it. So, right. No, I felt that. Well, my man, I really appreciate your time. Can um, I say one right? more thing? I want yeah. to thank, thank my lovely wife. She supported me over the years through all this. So I'll give her a shout out. <laughs> hey, let's go, wifey. Um, and we got to give her an extra shout out because she deals with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an easy one sometimes, especially when I get worked up about this cannabis plant. <laughs> no shit, dude. I feel you, man. I'd, uh, I uh, I don't know if I'm going to get my first gray hair from cannabis efforts or from the kid that's on the way. It'll be, yeah, the, it'll be the kid. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> the cannabis will help you keep the color. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> this strain, they call it back to black. No. Um, hey, Jeremiah, thanks for stopping by. Chris, Todd, everybody. All right, we're getting lots of love, man. Um well, it was a pleasure getting you on here, Philip. I appreciate everything you do for answering. So, I mean, I know sometimes I hit you with a ton of questions, and um, I'm just uh, grateful that we've been able to – our paths have crossed, and um, anything I can do, as you know, I'm here to help you as well. And uh, let's just keep making noise, keep uh, pushing forward, and fighting for what we know the people deserve. So let's get back to her and uh, – I'm sure we'll be talking about something tomorrow that we didn't plan on talking about because it'll pop up. So <laughs> Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. Everyone have a great night. The podcast is out.